Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark, and on today's show, we have time travel, Wonder Woman, and the search for intelligent life continues. You're not going to find any right here. How about on the rest of the panel? <laughs> also, here is John Schnepp. We're only making plans for Nigel. Hey, what's up, Nigel? <laughs> I was here, Jeremy Johns. <laughs> Not here. The uh, pre-orders for the SNES Classic dropped while I was sleeping. They're gone now. Also here, Clark Wolf. I like how our show today is essentially the show from yesterday. We've just exchanged one schmo for another. Hello! Hey. Hey. It's good to be back in town, so I did want to make a couple of quick announcements. First of all, I was not aware of the SNES Classic debacle, oh. but uh, I was too busy trying to order Madden 18 online. And we also have a very special announcement that I know was made public to you guys yesterday, and I wanted to use my own spectacular maple syrup <laughs> voice to reiterate The next Tuesday, you guys can come check out the whole Collider gang doing a very special screening at Arclight Hollywood of Jurassic Park. It's the movie with dinosaurs. It introduced <laughs> the world to raptors. They even got a basketball team out of it. 7.30, August 29th, we're going to be doing a Q&A. We're going to be screening the movie. Then afterwards, we're going to do a big meet and greet. Drinks will be had. Buy as many for Schnepp as you guys <laughs> care to. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. So looking forward to seeing all your smiling faces there. And on a very quick note, smiling faces. We lost two great ones this weekend. I know it was mentioned yesterday, but I did want to acknowledge the passing of Dick Gregory and Jerry Lewis. Thank you for the last. Thank you for the knowledge, gentlemen. All right, Ashley, what's our first official topic here today? New images of Josh Brolin as Cable and Deadpool 2 have appeared online thanks to the Twitter feed Universo X-Men. The all-new looks have given fans something to talk about, mostly about the possible time travel plot line the images seem to introduce. Some of the commentators believe that the new looks are coming before the visual effects will be added, mostly for Cable's cybernetic eye, while other fans, most of them comic fans, who know Cable's backstory inside and out believe the images offer up a clue to a time travel element that accompanies Cable's backstory. Deadpool 2 is currently filming in Vancouver with the movie set for release on June 1st, 2018. Mark, thoughts on the new images of Cable and do you believe there could be time travel introduced in Deadpool 2? You could put Josh Brolin in the Cable outfit on the toilet and I would <laughs> buy it. Anything that I see that has Cable in it, I get excited about. And when you incorporate a time travel aspect to it, it makes sense. And Shep, this is something that we talked about in our pre-show meeting which we were all there on time for mm -hmm. is that if you're gonna have cable in deadpool 2 you may as well take advantage of all that that character can bring to the table and time travel would be an intricate part of that right yeah for sure i think these uh pictures of captain squinty are just like they're just not processed <laughs> yet we we're like talking about how visual effects are going to be added there's going to be like a jj lens flare constantly following his eye so i think he's gonna you know obviously he's already cable he's probably in the midst of some kind of uh, time travel, it feels like that his outfits are going to change. I hope I hope we do get to go into the future. Absolutely, yeah. And and Clark, a lot of times when you have these shots that come out from a movie set and they're not done, they're not touched up. We had that with sometimes it looks fine, sometimes it looks like X Men Apocalypse. They're like, ah, Oscar Isaac's costume is not done yet. So, do you think this is a situation where it is going to be touched up and we are going to see more effects added to what we have in this aesthetic, or do you think? It's cut and dry, that's cable, and we get time travel. I think that it's uh, going to be that um, this is this is just not a finished effect. It's not a finished look, uh, which is the problem when you have like paparazzi photos or you have far away photos because it doesn't necessarily paint the, an accurate picture. However, um, I think like Schnepp alluded to, I don't, you know, and he said very brilliantly in our pre-show meeting, I don't know how you have time traveling <laughs> cable and not have him time travel. So uh, even if that does end up happening in the movie, I think these photos are just not finished yet. Yeah, now Jeremy, when you look at what Cable can bring mm -hmm. to the table, you also have the fact that this is Deadpool's movie mm -hmm. and Cable is involved in it, so is bringing time travel to a Deadpool movie, is that the right move in your eyes? I think it is. Well, I mean, like like they've all said, you can't have Cable without time travel. Cable without time travel is like Indiana Jones without archaeology. You know, it's just kind of the thing that <laughs> the guy... A museum. Right, uh, but it does open a lot of doors for the humor that they could do, it being a movie that breaks the fourth wall. I mean, mm -hmm. Cable could come back and be like, yeah, and and 
stop at the sixth movie, please. You know, and he'll be like, wait, what do you mean? You know what I mean? You can do stuff like that. I can already see the pro the marketing material right now. This will be a poster. And if it's not a poster, I know you guys out there, I've seen you make posters online. You make this poster of Cable and, Dead, uh, uh, Cable and Deadpool with one foot in the DeLorean checking their watches. Time travel poster, Deadpool 2. Someone out there is going to make it. If you don't make it, the studio will. So oh, just make it. I don't hate that idea. How about one with like them as like Bill and Ted like doing yes. this? Yes. Oh. All the time That's travel so posters That's ever. So Absolutely. You know. Oh, man. You know, We're doing it. I love when the first story results in a good old-fashioned John's Ellis poster fight. This is exciting <laughs> stuff. Something I wanted to bring up to the panel, too, is that we've seen so many promo images for Cable in the last few weeks. Do you think that he's going to have a huge part in this movie? How big is the role of Cable mm. going to be in Deadpool 2, Schnapp? Um, it's probably going to be relatively large because they're trying to not only introduce Cable, but introduce X-Force and introduce these other spin-offs. There's mm -hmm. going to be Domino and Cable. So it's going to be Deadpool's movie, just like the first one was. And Colossus played a pretty big, bigger role than we all thought he would be playing in Deadpool. I think it's going to be Cable's role be a little bit larger than what Colossus played. That's a good barometer to hit Jeremy Johns. Is it going to be Colossus level, a little bit less, a little bit more? Uh, at, at least as much as Colossus, possibly more. Clark Wolf, you sign off on this notion. I sure do, and I don't know how you cast jo someone like Josh Brolin in this right. role only to have him play a small part. I think mm -hmm. if they're going big, they're they're going to go for it. That's right. I mean, the, the appearance of Cable is something that was teased in the last Deadpool movie, so there's a lot of build up to this and whereas Colossus was a great not a surprise because we knew he was going to be in there but we didn't know he was going to have that media of a role I think you get that and a whole lot more with Cable and again that's why you get somebody like Josh Brolin to play this role so I'm very excited about these pictures I think the whole panel is let us know your thoughts in the comments section on YouTube afterwards right now in the meantime we're going to move on to our next story which involves this <laughs> Wonder Woman has hit another record for the DCEU. The movie crossed 800 million worldwide and is now the second biggest movie of the year, only behind Disney's Beauty and the Beast. The Patty Jenkins directed film has surpassed every expectation, both critically and commercially, passing 400 million at the domestic box office, the only summer movie to do so. And now, thanks to Box Office Mojo, that number puts Wonder Woman just past Sam Raimi's original Spider Man film, making Wonder Woman the highest grossing super superhero origin story ever released. Wonder Woman 2 is currently in active development with Patty Jenkins in negotiations to return and a release date set for December 13th, 2019. Clark, thoughts on Wonder Woman becoming the highest grossing origin movie in the superhero genre? I think it's great. I mean, we touched on it a little bit on yesterday's show, but ultimately I think what we're seeing is A, a character that audiences have wanted to see lead their own film for a really long time, but also I don't think you would have had this kind of success had the movie not not only resonated with those fans, but been a solid effort. Um, and I think that, you know, all the pieces coming together uh, to, for Wonder Woman to wear that, you know, those accolades I think is well-deserved. And I also think Think it's kind of amazing when you hear that the two biggest movies of the year are Beauty and the Beast and Wonder Woman. Like, geez, what do those movies have in common? I mean, <laughs> I, I think that that's really important and it's great. It's it's just fun to note and it's important to note. So I think it's awesome. Yeah, to me, this says something about Wonder Woman's staying power and replay factor because a lot of people were excited to see Wonder Woman like they were Spider-Man or like they were even something like Deadpool. If you look at the opening numbers, just the opening domestic weekend, Wonder Woman came in fifth as far as superhero origin movies go. At number one was Suicide Squad, which I guess you can technically count as an origin story, Deadpool, Man of Steel, and Spider-Man. Those are all coming before Wonder Woman, yet Wonder Woman has outgrossed all of them over time, and I think that it's an accumulation of people. Good word of mouth helps, critical reception, tomato score, all that stuff factors in, but just getting to see a character on the big screen that a lot of people have been waiting their entire lives to check out, as opposed to being inundated with a bunch of male superheroes that we have seen before. This was something new. This was something different. I think it gives Patty Jenkins a little bit more negotiating powers. If she needed any more leverage in in those rooms <clears throat> you got it right here the highest grossing superhero origin movie of all time jeremy johns a worthy champion in your eyes uh yeah absolutely i thought the movie was it was a lot of fun it was great it needed to resonate with a lot of people who wanted to see wonder woman a lot of people can argue that the future of the dceu might have been on this movie's shoulders stuck to landing for both i love the fact that you talked about the staying power because we see a lot of hollywood like okay we need to land the first weekend and that's what we need to do. Whereas Wonder Woman, 
got its success through many, many, many weekends. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's not going to change the business model of Hollywood movies at all, but I think that is an interesting thing to uh, to go into and go, hey, how about you make a movie that does have staying power? You know, How about you make a movie that doesn't have to just crush the first weekend, then it's forgotten because, I mean, we, we are in the ADHD world, you know? Like, everything is really important now, and then it's not important the next weekend, but we kept hearing about Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. and, that, and that completely showed. That's right, and Shneb, we live in a world where the box office... Numbers change all the time, and you're going to continue to set records simply because of inflation when it comes to ticket prices. Right. Tickets today are a lot more expensive than they were when Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man came out. But I think the fact that Wonder Woman has held on this long and has grossed so much more than any other superhero origin movie says a lot. It says a lot. I mean, a lot of people have, have been comparing this to the Superman the movie 1978 film because mm -hmm. cause it's a really a, a well-done, well-told origin story. It's a really well-directed film. It's really well-acted by Gal Gadot. A lot of people were doubting all of these things before the movie came out for months and speculation for years about this movie could be the nail in the coffin of the DCEU. It's actually the opposite. It kind of revived the hopes to make the DCU kind of different from Marvel, but somewhat competitive. So I feel like uh, it was great to see Wonder Woman and to see such a fun film, to go see a fun superhero film, not just because it's a, a female superhero film, but Wonder Woman is a character that needed her own film for you know the past 75 years. So what a great way to go. And that's, you know, staying power is just like Star Wars where people kept talking about, you've got to see this movie, you've got to see this movie. That doesn't happen that much. Like you mentioned mm -hmm. in this kind of, you know, 15 seconds later, I already forgot the news world that we live in. So it's like for people to keep talking about it week after week and for repeat viewings, that doesn't happen anymore except for this film. That's right. I mean, when I look back on the summer of 2017, I'll have my own personal memory of course. And then when I think about the box office, you know, th th there were some movies that came out that I wasn't a huge fan of. You know, I, I didn't love the Pirates movies. I didn't love the Transformers movies. There's some great gems in there. I was a huge fan of Dunkirk and Baby Driver and War for the Planet of the Apes. But I will remember this summer as being dominated by Wonder Woman, by everything in the movie and surrounding the movie and such a, a rush of positive feeling towards Wonder Woman, towards the DCU and above and beyond. So I think it's a worthy champion as of right now for the best superhero origin movie at least in terms of box office domestically so wonder woman congratulations and uh patty jenkins let's let's get some ink on paper and let's start making another movie here all right well speaking of box office we do have some movies opening this weekend ashley's going to tell us about one of them and it involves dragons yeah birth of the dragon young bruce lee is trying to make a name for himself while working as a martial arts instructor in 1964 san francisco when lee meets wong jack man he challenges the kung fu master to a no holds barred fight that became the stuff of legend. This is a legendary fight that, that there's a lot of mixed reports as opposed to like what actually happened, but it is based on a true story. And when you read that, it's like, yeah, I want to know a lot more about this. I want to see every aspect of this fight. They're going to have to take some liberties with the actual story because I don't even know if it has been correctly documented. I don't know that you can put that lightning back in the bottle, Jeremy, and be like, no, this is the actual story of it. But if you're going to take a historical event and then extrapolate and make it a little more sensationalized, a little fictionalized, I'm on board with it if it's Birth of the Dragon. How are you feeling about that? I absolutely agree with you because Bruce Lee has always had a fascinating life. There's a fascinating story behind the man. So when I saw this trailer, I was like, get out of town. Mm -hmm. What? A story mm -hmm. about Bruce Lee? However, I always, in situations like this, when they're based on a true story, but two people saw the story, you have to know <laughs> where, or you have to wonder where the story came from. It reminds me of Jack Sparrow in the good Pirates of the Caribbean movie where they said the Black Pearl leaves no survivors. He goes, no survivors. So where do the stories come from, I wonder? And, and you have to, st I, I remember pulling back in the theater. I was like, that is a really good point. And I will remember that if they ever make a, mo a movie about Bruce Lee's secret fight. And so in this super secret fight, I want to know where the story came from. So you're right. They're going to take liberties. But if the fight happened, it's fascinating enough that it even happened at all. So I want to see the story around the fight. I want to see the fight itself. Instantly interested. This is the closest thing that reality has to the Rocky Apollo fight that they had <laughs> right. in private. Yeah, no one knows about it. After he said he owes him for training him after he beat Clubber Lang. Then they go into the gym and they just swing. And all we see is that initial punch. Mm -hmm. And then it's immortalized in pain. 
entertaining. And then we all know what happened to Apollo when he took on Drago. So I think that when you have a story like this, Clark, I promise I'm not just going to be watching this movie and thinking, oh, that's Rocky and that's Apollo. But like, it's pretty cool to see something like this have happened. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I um, like a lot of the uh, sports movies that we cover here on uh, that are coming out here on uh, Movie Talk. I didn't know about this. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I just missed this part of pop culture, I guess. So I think that it's a, it sounds like a fascinating story. And um, Bruce Lee is one of those uh, iconic um, figures in film that, that just, you know, was taken too early and, uh, and probably didn't do as much as we would have liked to have seen. So I think we're always going to be fascinated by his, uh, by his story. So I think it sounds exciting. Yeah, what was it? Was it Dragon the Bruce Lee story? Yeah, Dragon uh, the Bruce Lee. Was that Jason yeah, right. Scott Lee was in? Yeah. It, it, was, it was really good telling of it. Schnapp, you excited about seeing Birth of the Dragon, or are you going to wait until you can catch it on a, on a Netflix No, I'm situation? a big fan of Bruce Lee. I used to watch all the Bruce Lee movies when I was a kid. Um, so I, I, I look forward to all these kind of lot of fictionalized, is what I would call this, like extra fictionalized yeah. storytelling. It's a rumor that yeah. they're turning and, into And also, Drago and Rocky are not real characters. You know that, Well, right? no, they are. I'm, I'm going to Philly in a couple weeks. Oh they they have God. a statue. Why would they build a statue? The all right, Ellis, real. we'll talk about this after movie talk. Anyway... <laughs> The trailer got me hooked, and I was like, I like the way that they're playing, that they're playing Bruce Lee as not just like a goody two-shoes, that he has the ego, mm -hmm. that he has the bossiness, that he has to, you know, I mean, if, if no one saw Ip Man, that's another movie to definitely check out, the first two Ip Mans, maybe not the one where he fight, fights Mike Tyson, skip that one, but for <laughs> real, I'm not joking, it's real. Yeah, that, I know. That's yeah. It, yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, I'm looking forward to this, I can't wait. I, hopefully it does what we all want it to do, we have a great fictionalized storytelling loosely based on the the reality. That's right. Birth of the Dragon comes out in theaters this weekend. And don't listen to what Schnepp says. You can check any of the Rocky documentaries out anytime you want. They're available on Blu-ray or just come over to my place. All right, let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to give us a topic. We'll say whether we buy it or sell it. And then Schnepp and I get in more fights. What's up first? <laughs> THR is reporting that Amblin Entertainment has hired Stranger Things director Rebecca Tomix to direct the sci-fi film Intelligent Life. The project centers on a United Nations employee who monitors outer space and makes contact with a beautiful woman who may be an alien. Thomas will also do some additional writing on the script, which was originally penned by Colin Trevorrow and Derek Connolly. The project previously had Ava DuVernay attached to direct with Lupita Nyong'o to star, but both have since left the project. Thomas is on the rise signing on for a number of projects that include a live-action retelling of The Little Mermaid for Universal, as well as adapting the John Green book, Looking for Alaska for Paramount, both of which are still in development. A release date for Intelligent Life has not been announced. Schnett, buy or sell Amblin's Intelligent Life with Rebecca Thomas at the helm. I'm going to tentatively buy it. I mean, it sounds, you know, whenever I hear, like, that the script keeps getting polished for year after year, and it goes through a bunch of different directors and actors and stars, and so that's kind of where this is at, but... I think she did a great job on Stranger Things. Uh, it sounds like it could be an interesting mix of Starman, K-Pax, and E.T., maybe the dash of Explorers. We're getting 80s style here, but that's what Amblin's all about, so uh, I'm going to buy it. Uh, Jeremy Johns. Yeah, well, it was funny because you're bringing up all the 80s movies. <laughs> From that description... There's a part of me that it feel, I feel like it could be some deeper meaning, intelligent life, you know, mm. first contact movie. Right. And then it sounds like Splash in Space if you look at it from another way. Yes. So I'm like, I don't know the tone. One thing I do like is I like the fact that people from Stranger Things are getting work because Stranger Things is a crockpot of talent. Like, and none of the talent was wasted. And so it's this new thing. With so many names, faces, and people that you can be like, okay, you now have a job, you now have a job, you now have a job. These are teasers for the review for Stranger Things I have yet to do, but I swear to you will do. You have seen, well, she didn't direct, she's directing an episode yeah. on the upcoming season. Oh, yeah. So upcoming we're season. seeing, yeah, yeah. So, so she's worked, we haven't seen Rebecca Thomas's work on Stranger Things just yet, but we will see it when it comes out, and I'm glad that you're finally caught up on Netflix. <laughs> oh, I, I've seen Stranger Things twice. I just haven't reviewed it. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I wait with bated breath for <laughs> your take on there's it. There's a difference. I, people always say, like, how come you didn't watch this movie? I'm like, there's a difference between watch and review. Now, everything I review, I have watched. Not everything I watch, I review. It basically, I had to get past the hype train and then watch it. Mm. So it wasn't like it didn't uh, cloud my judgment. Then after I watched it, I was like, well, I might as well wait before season two comes out to review it and then roll into season two, watch and review that. So it's been like a year long plan that I've had because I'm more patient than I look. Uh, Clark, I'm leaving an angry comment on Jeremy's page. Can you go ahead and tell us whether you buy or sell this story? Sure. While you troll Jeremy on his YouTube channel, uh, <laughs> America's favorite pastime, I will say that I buy this news. Um, but I do think it's interesting 
interesting uh, how, you know, well, uh, never mind. I'm not even going to go because I don't want to deal with getting trolled by America's pastime. But they're on my page. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. yeah, they're distracted. No, I was just going to say, like, I think that it's really interesting how a lady director, when she gets a little bit of heat on her, all of a sudden gets attached to everything that could be a lady project, i.e., uh, you know, this is about a beautiful uh, female alien. The, uh, she's attached to the Little Mermaid. It's like, it's just, it's um, it's interesting to me noticing this trend, whether, and it, so, yeah, it'll, I, because I was looking at her IMDb beforehand, and uh, she hasn't done that much. She hasn't done that much as a writer or a director. Um, and so, so, but Stranger Things, as Jeremy said, I think is a pop culture litmus test, and Hollywood is paying attention. So basically, I think Hollywood is saying, okay, if you've done anything on Stranger Things, whether it's the Duffer, Duffers, whether it's the cast, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Levy, you know, Hollywood is saying, okay, there's something cool here, so let's snatch it up. I think there's something to be said for what your your points are, is that I, I buy this overall because I'm glad that somebody like Rebecca Thomas is getting work, and a lot of times directors can be attached to projects, you can do a polish of something, and then it never ends up either getting made or it ends up changing hands multiple times, but I think Hart makes a great point where there's a lot of female-led stories that I think should be told through that lens, and I think that you should have a director who can come from it from that point of view. It doesn't mean that there's one female director that exists in Hollywood that you have to go to for every female-led project you have. There's a plethora of female talent available, and so sometimes it does feel like Hollywood is just dipping its toe in that water, but then they're also trying to play it safe at the same time with somebody who's proven as opposed to somebody who maybe hasn't done an episode of this huge Netflix show that none of us have seen that episode yet, so maybe go after somebody else. But I don't want to pin all of that on this specific story because Intelligent Life sounds like a really neat premise. It sounds like something that if Rebecca Thomas does a good job of Stranger Things and she's inundated in a science fiction world already, that she could crush this thing. And I like the way it sounds too. It's got a little bit of a species flair to it as well, mm -hmm. Schnapp. There's a little bit of a spe a, bit, a little bit of like a sure. Natasha Henstridge walking around like, hey, I'm gonna buy this lady a drink. She just threw her tail into my spine. What is happening right now? So intelligent life. Do you think that this is gonna be the next movie that Rebecca Thomas does, or do you think that The Little Mermaid is gonna happen? Do you think these other projects are gonna materialize first? Well, I think uh, we were talking about it before the show. Um, they're definitely gonna do The Little Mermaid because there's heat on that. And there's going to be heat on this. I mean, it sounds like it. this is a movie that could follow in that 80s footstep. That's why they're grabbing all the talent from Stranger Things, which is set in the 80s. So it makes sense to me. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm more interested to see this film than The Little Mermaid, obviously. I don't I'm, even know. A little, I'm a little intrigued by that little mer by Universal Little Mermaid because as much as I love what Disney's <laughs> doing with their live action stuff, there's a little part of it. It's like, I wonder what that other Jungle Book is going to bring to the table. I wonder what that other dark, because the Little Mermaid, the Hans Christian Anderson Little Mermaid, that can get a little dark. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you, no, you're not, you're not wrong. That's the thing I'm looking forward to is because uh, Disney's doing their live action versions, but other studios are picking it up, and it looks like it's just kind of doubling down on the same thing. But if they're going by the source material, it's not. Those Disney movies are pretty messed up. Yeah, really yeah. I mean, are you up for a universal version of The Little Mermaid? Is that the next movie Rebecca Thomas should do? It's the next movie in the dark universe is the, is the, is the true Ooh. Little Mermaid Ouch. story. Uh, no, you know, it's funny because uh, Sofia Coppola, and it's so hard with these competing projects. I know she was attached to a Little Mermaid. Do you guys remember if it was Disney or if it was Universal? I can't quite remember. Chloe Moretz was going to play The Little yep, Mermaid. And, yeah. and, and, and Sofia Coppola was at yeah. attached to direct, but ultimately walked away. And what we heard, the reason she walked away is because she wanted to do a more dark interpretation mm. closer to the original fairy tale. Uh, and ultimately the studio said, no, thank you. We don't want to do that. So some, that makes me think that it was a Dis she was attached to the Disney version. But either way, I mean, look, if Universal is actually going to go for it and they're actually, I, they've been wanting to make this movie for a while. There have been a lot of people attached to it throughout the years. So um, yeah, It'll be interesting to see which one comes first. And fairy tales get dark, kids. It's not what you were told when you were five years old. Sometimes Santa comes down the chimney with an axe. <laughs> 
Right, that got a little too dark. Let's move on to our next topic. <laughs> I'm scared. DHR is reporting that Deadpool villain Ed Screen is in negotiations to join the cast of Lionsgate's Hellboy reboot. Screen will play Major Ben Damio, a member of the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, who can turn into a jaguar when angered or in pain. Screen joins Ian McShane as Hellboy's adopted father, with Mila Jovovich playing the villainess. Stranger Things David Harbour was the first to join the reboot as Hellboy, with the actor recently dropping some info on Josh Horowitz's Happy, Sad, Confused podcast. Harbour confirmed that there won't be an origin story and likens the new movie to something more akin to Indiana Jones, saying, There is something of his origin, but it's not really an origin story movie. We kind of pick up the movie like we're running and gunning. We do have a little bit of stuff where we show stuff, but it really is a story, and you just drop in with this guy in a way. I feel like that's kind of what Indiana Jones was. You start with him him stealing the idol, but also you do go back to the university, and you understand he's an archaeologist, but this is just a guy who goes and steals idols and fights Nazis and wants to steal the Ark of the Covenant. Jeremy Byersell harbors comments about the Hellboy reboot. I like it a lot. Um, we're, Hollywood's learning now that we don't have to see the origin. We don't have to see Uncle Ben die every time. You know, it's right. a, it completely works. If you kind of pick up at a point in their adulthood, you get the gist of who they are. You get that a path has led them here. Maybe you can have a couple of comments in the story. Someone's like, oh, hey, remember the time? And, and, and you just go. You go forward. I love the fact that he, uh, at first, I thought that he was going to say, no, it's like Indiana Jones, but he's kind of attributing the, uh, the origin story to Indiana Jones. I think, it's a, I think it's a good way to do it in a world where people are like, I'm done with the origins. We've seen Hellboy's origin. We get the gist. We know something from his past is probably going to creep up and, uh, and do something big in the present, but we don't need to see him as a baby to do that. Mm. Now, I, look, I love a good origin story, but it doesn't mean you need to do it in a paint-by-numbers fashion where, okay, the first act is explaining who this person is and the setup, then we go on to their adventure. You can do this in an inventive way, like what Jeremy's talking about. So I buy David Harbour's comments because Neil Marshall, the director, he's worked on a lot of Game of Thrones episodes. He's directed a lot of them. And Game of Thrones does a fantastic job of sometimes giving us a beat-by-beat -beat origin story, then other times just dropping in little hints of things that happened in the past in Westeros that we can take with us and apply to future actions. So, Shep, I think this is a no-brainer. And I also buy uh, Ed Screen. Ed Screen. Ed. Screen. I buy Ed in this movie because he's a guy who really was great in Deadpool. And he also, he's had some other roles where he didn't really get a chance to shine, like I think his talent. So I think he's going to be able to illuminate us with that in the new Hellboy. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, throw me the corpse and I'll throw you the fairy. <laughs> I mean, we're really going to literally, I mean, they've already alluded to the using that corpse part of the story from one of the uh, you know one of the comic books they're adapting that and they've already cast the fairy I would love to see that as the opening action sequence that has nothing to do with the main story but that's just a way to get right into the Hellboy mythos I mean they've already Guillermo touched on that already so it's like it would be nice to see that as an expanded thing uh, a standalone little set piece and then he goes back to the PP the BPRD so yeah I love it so. Clark Wolf, you a fan as well? Yeah, I'm going to buy these comments. However, I do want to buy them with a grain of salt because I think David Harbour has been watching the Indiana Jones, I'm going to say trilogy because I don't count Crystal Skull. It is true. But um, <laughs> because I spoke with David Harbour back in, I think, May or June on a red carpet about Stranger Things, and he compared Hop in season two to Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's gunning for that role. I, I, yeah. so, I swear to you. I swear to you. He brought up Indiana Jones again. And so when I read this, I was like, David Harbour, have you been watching Indiana Jones this weekend? And so I, I like the comparison. And he goes out of his way on the podcast to explain the comparison, which I think is great. But I'm just saying, I mean, he could be talking about cooking spaghetti and it would probably be like <laughs> Indiana Jones or something. Indiana Jones probably ate a lot of spaghetti because like, he's a single guy. He swings for most of his life. And if you're one of those people you know that you probably cook a lot of spaghetti or at least oodles of noodles the best ramen that money can afford <laughs> all right let's move on to our mailbag but before we get to mailbag we want to remind you guys the collider video we have a lot of shows here on our fair youtube channel including all new episodes of tv talking heroes that air every day that's right tv talking heroes are daily heroes is hosted by that young man right over there john schnepp who looks a little terrified at this news. And we also have TV Talk, which is hosted by Joshua Hercules Makuga, and that actually goes live right after us at 11 a.m. PST. We also have a huge team edition of the movie Trivia Schmodown dropping later on today. And for a sneak peek, here we go.
whole lot of Schmodown going on later on today and for the rest of the month of August and September. Look for more editions of the Ultimate Schmodown Tournament. Uh, there is going to be a new comic book shopping with John Schnepp dropping tomorrow. There was a Thrones talk that dropped yesterday. And once again, I want to remind you guys that we're going to be doing a special screening of Jurassic Park at the Arclight in Hollywood, California, August 29th, 7.30 p.m. It's going to be a lot of fun. Will Jeremy John show up? Oh. <laughs> well, if he doesn't, we don't know if he's showing up yet. It was it was brought to my attention that, yes, you can get drinks at the meet and greet afterwards, but Jeremy also apparently has drinks in his apartment. So we don't know if we're going to be able to pry him away from there, but I will promise you guys this. You can have Jeremy Johns come to your home through the computer every Friday on his show, Awesome Tacky, where you can get the link to the latest episode in this vid description. You like how I recovered that for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was waiting for Awesome Tacular, and yeah. you just threw it to me, and I was like, I haven't even decided what weird face I'm going to make for Awesome I was confused, Mark, but thank you. you, you I am always I was here for totally ready for the finger point. Yeah, he was going to finger point. Yeah. We had a plan. Yeah. We kind of had a plan. Mark read that. You know, this reminds me of Indiana Jones and the <laughs> Temple of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> the best laid plans. I will give you guys all my Shankar. I love stories. it when a plan comes together. <laughs> That's not Minnie Jones, but the A-Team is good dun, enough dun, for dun, me. Dun, dun, we are going to remind dun, you guys at the end of the show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now. Wendy Lee Zaney is our gatekeeper. You will treat her with respect as you do all of us. And now we go to Mailbag. You guys can write us anytime. Collidervideo at gmail.com. Sometimes we'll answer it on our show Movie Talk. Sometimes we'll do it on our weekend show Mailbag. And right now we're going to do one. Thanks to Ashley Mova. Nigel S. writes, Hey Collider, why does a great American movie such as Logan Lucky fail at the U.S. box office whilst the British Dunkirk succeeds? In Logan Lucky, you have a great American film director making a caper involving a great American motor series. Dunkirk is about an event in World War II that most Americans have not heard of. I'm sure you will say Chris Nolan is the factor, but I refuse to believe his name has greater weight with the American viewing audience than Steven Soderbergh. Am I key I'm keen to know what your thoughts are on this. Uh, I am uh, keen to give you my answer, <laughs> Nigel. I think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a fair question because they're two very different style movies, and I think promotion might be one of the biggest things, is that everybody knew that there was a movie called Dunkirk coming out. Christopher Nolan's name is a good reason why, and not just when you see marketing materials one or two or three weeks in advance. This movie had been announced. It was Nolan's next project. Everybody heard the title Dunkirk. A lot of them did not know what it was about. A lot of people didn't know about this story that happened during World War II. So I think there's some intrigue in there. And when you have a war movie with a good cast and a great director, you're going to get more eyeballs and more attention, as opposed to Logan Lucky, who did have a great cast and a great director, but it was such a, a smaller promotional scale than what you got for Dunkirk. Dunkirk, although it was a war movie, and I think it would have factored in just fine during Oscar season, it had a summer blockbuster promotion behind it. Logan Lucky did not. It felt like an August release where they're not just throwing it to the wind, but they're going to take their time. They're going to spend their money wisely and be frugal about it. And I think that it actually paid off for Logan Lucky as well because it had a decent opening week and it did not cost nearly as much as Dunkirk to make. So I wouldn't just judge Dunkirk versus Logan Lucky on quality of the film or interest of the film based on box office numbers alone. Sometimes it's fair to do that. I don't think so in this case. How about you, Clark? Yeah, um, I agree. Nigel. Nigel. Hello, love. Uh, it's nice <laughs> to see you. So I have bad news for you. Christopher Nolan is absolutely one of the deciding factors in why Dunkirk has been a huge smash. In addition to but, but, but there are a couple and, and okay, so Dunkirk, hundred million dollar movie. Okay, uh, Logan Lucky, thirty million dollar movie. Christopher Nolan directed a Batman trilogy. S Steven Soderbergh directed The Nick uh, and retired from making movies before he came out of retirement. I mean, Soderbergh is absolutely a cinematic genius. Uh, I think he's an incredible director, and I think mm -hmm. he's an incredible visionary. But he is not making the commercial movies that Christopher Nolan is. Christopher Nolan is a brand at this point, where I don't believe that Soderbergh is as much of a brand to mainstream audiences. Um, 
uh, or Nolan is the brand and mainstream audiences and Soderbergh isn't. So yeah, I think Nolan is the big selling point. Well, here. it's interesting to trace the timeline of the two directors, Schnepp, because you know Christopher Nolan was the guy who came on the scene in a very independent way. If you have something like Memento, and then you move on to the Prestige, things like that. Then when he did ba- what he was able to do with Batman and and restore us from bat nipples to the Dark Knight graziness that we got, I think that that elevated his star to such a level that now Christopher Nolan is that name. And Steven Soderbergh, although he's done huge movies in the past, the Ocean's Eleven trilogy, that is, you go to see those movies because you're going to see all these famous people rob Andy Garcia together, right. as opposed to saying, oh, well, Soderbergh's doing this, so now I need to check it out. <laughs> Eventually, Steven Soderbergh became a guy that you rely on to see great cast do fun things together. So wh- whether it's something like The Informant or, uh, or Side Effects even, which is not that fun, Contagion, which is a whole lot of not fun, but still really good cast. It's just that I don't think that they put the director's foot as forward as they do Christopher Nolan. So do you see Nolan being the biggest reason why Dunkirk was so successful? Well, I mean, once again, like what Clark was saying, there was a lot of money put behind Dunkirk. Not only was it shot 70 millimeter, it was in IMAX screens. It had a lot of promotion. And Steven Soderbergh, you know, he came in on the independency and he kind of what he's what put Sundance on the map with Sex, Lies and Videotape. Mm-hmm. He's done so many different kinds of films. I mean, he is a true auteur. He's also a true just work worker. He will be a cinematographer. He will be an editor. He will do things. He's a filmmaker's filmmaker. And uh, I mean, not to say that uh, Christopher Nolan isn't, but Christopher Nolan's very specific with his films. He's very methodical. He's like, this is the film I'm doing, and I'm only going to work on this for several years, then I'm doing this next film. While Soderbergh will take chances, do TV shows, do one-offs, do as many different kinds of films and movies as possible to produce films. So um, with Logan Lucky, that's an independently made film that Steven Soderbergh found the financing for himself and he's in charge of the marketing himself, him and the small you know, team. So they didn't go the regular route of putting posters up and doing all the kinds of things that we saw for Dunkirk or any of the other films, the giant budgeted films. And I think that their P&A was, I think it was 29,000, 30, I'm mean, sorry, 30 million, I think the total was for the marketing of it. So, and they didn't even spend that yet. So I feel like uh, they're doing it a different way. And so it might be perceived as a failure in this area that we are right now, late late August, where a lot of films don't make that much money anyway when they come out. So I think you'll see if the plan works over the next following few weekends when these when the money's actually spent, you're going to keep seeing commercials for Logan Lucky. You're going to keep seeing this, and word of mouth is going to keep going on for a while. We'll see what happens at the box office. Jeremy, as a professional projectionist, I want your take on this, because yes. I think that one of the biggest reasons Dunkirk was successful Successful is that people like, like me included saw the film and were like, if you want to see this movie, you should see this in a theater. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that the same could be said for Logan Lucky or even something that I did enjoy like, like Baby Drive. I didn't see Logan Lucky yet, but there's a lot of great movies that came out this summer. There's not a whole lot of movies that I'm going to tell somebody at home, you need to rush out to a movie theater to experience this and be overwhelmed by it. But I think Dunkirk was one of those movies. Yeah, Dunkirk was definitely made for, for the IMAX screen. Uh, Logan Lucky, I feel like you can watch on Netflix and you'll be completely fine. Uh, I feel like when a director becomes established, and actually for a lot of directors, it's not British director and British audience and American director and American audience, they're, they're interchangeable. Christopher Nolan's one of the biggest directors working at all right now. Um, example, the trailer for Interstellar, the teaser trailer had a rocket going up into space, and my friends and I were like, fuck yeah, I'm on board, because <laughs> it's Christopher Nolan and a rocket went into space. Now, if it was Soderbergh and the teaser trailer was a rocket that went into space, I would be like, all right, well, I don't know much about it, but okay. And if I, I kind of want to do an experiment now where you just think about both movies, Dunkirk and Logan Lucky, and if you swap directors, now Christopher Nolan directed Logan Lucky, and Soderbergh directed Dunkirk, I don't think Dunkirk would have made as much money, and I think Logan Lucky would have made more. So in that, I feel, I feel like, yeah, Christopher Nolan is a huge factor in why Dunkirk made as much as Dunkirk made. You know, if you want to get back to your projecting roots, I know somebody at Arclight, maybe you could be the projectionist for Jurassic Park on Tuesday. I'm, I'm going to tell you. That would actually be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> the film breaks. That's the guy to talk to. All right, let's move on to live Twitter questions. At Collider Video is our Twitter handle, and hopefully somebody did it already because we're throwing it to Wendy right now. All right, this first one comes from Blue Leaves 13 who writes, with the news that it could open to $50 million, could it be possible to become a top five grossing horror movie requiring $350 million? 
Schnepp, I'm throwing it to you first. I didn't hear it because there's a spider. Oh, okay, a spider. they're, they're, they're playing around with the spider. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yes, oh it most definitely will. Now that they removed that second week of Inhumans and it is going to be taking over all those IMAX screens, it most definitely is going to take all of that money. It's probably going to make more than $50 million. Yeah, I think it is going to be every bit as monstrous as that spider. Don't worry, Wendy. It's a really tiny one, and it's, it, it went away. There, uh, all, there <laughs> are no tiny spiders. They're all giant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's going to crush. I think it is going to absolutely destroy box office. I mean, we, we saw what it did on YouTube with its trailer, getting so many hits in the first week. It's just one of those movies that the marketing's been great. People are aware of the source material. There's a scary clown. He's offering balloons to kids. That is enough to get people into the theater to get their frights going. I think it's going to be an incredible success. Clark Wolf, have you recovered? I have recovered from, thank you for saving me from the evil what spider. Uh, yes, so I actually, while we were taping today, I just got word that the social media embargo on it is lifting on the 25th. Ooh. And today to is the 22nd. Ooh. So maybe yeah. tune into my Twitter feed on the 25th. Hey, wait a minute. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's going to make a ton of money. It's going to make so much money, and I can't wait to see it in IMAX. I'm so excited. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The thing that I hope studios take away from the success of it, which I think it will have, uh, is that a movie that has great characters and great scares and treats the audience like adults uh, and is a, you know, a heartfelt story that is scary as hell or has potential to be scary as hell, uh, that's what you should take away from this studios. Not a Stephen King adaptation, not a scary clown movie. Like, <laughs> please keep, please start making more good, solid, R-rated mm. horror movies. And Jeremy Johns, how are we doing opening weekend with It? Well, yeah, as a projectionist, I'll say uh, <laughs> it, it, it will make, uh, it, it'll make a fair amount of money because uh, people have been clamoring for it. Even a year ago, there were viral videos about killer clowns on Facebook. Right. I mean, this stuff has been building for a while. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, Clark. Make a make a cerebral horror movie, and I hope more horror movies follow suit in that. I'd, I'd like to know what the top five highest grossing horror movies right now are. Don't have time to look into it. I'll do it later. But uh, will it take those down or or move past them? Mm. Quite not, possibly. Well, not adjusted for inflation because The Exorcist yeah. played for yeah, yeah. a thousand years right. <laughs> on yeah, the right. big screen. But yeah, it's it, a good it's, point. It's interesting to think about opening weekend, but also the legs that it could have because you go right into Halloween season. So if it gets good word of mouth and, and critical reception, all that stuff, it's opening weekend, then that movie is going to be a steamroller for a while. All right, what's our next question? This one comes from Stephen Grant, who writes... Have you ever asked for your money back from a theater after seeing a movie? I did after Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Awful. So Ooh. I wish I thought about that in Mortal Kombat Annihilation because I think I did walk out of that movie. But there's like some rule, I think, in most theaters that if you are in a movie and you're, you just hate the movie and you leave within like 30 or 35 minutes, I forget. It might be a different cutoff depending on what theater you're at. You can actually get your money back. You can actually say, hey, uh, I'm really not having a good time. You can make crap, but you can be like, hey, there's this guy and he's got his feet out or these people talking about it on the cell phone. I'd just rather have my money back. Make it whatever excuse you want, but if you're having a bad time in the theater and you're only in there for like half an hour, you gave the movie a fair enough shot and it's just murdering you, then you should get out of there and you should get your money back. I myself have never asked for a refund because of the quality of a movie. Um, I usually just fault my own judgment on that as opposed to the movie theater that's displaying it, but to each their own. Jeremy? As a projectionist, <laughs> I can say people who ask for their money back after the movie, people in the theater don't generally like those people. It's like, a really, you want to look at them and be like, did you eat a hamburger? Did you like it? Did you vomit it up and get your money back afterwards? No, because that's just not how consumerism works. You kind of have to bite the bullet and be like, okay, maybe I'll just pay a little more attention. You're right, though. There's about a 20-minute mark when, you know, 15, 20 minute where you can be like, all right, I know where this is going. This is not me. I'll go maybe I'll get a pass for another movie maybe I'll get my money back but you should be able to pull out in time but at a point if you are in it like if, if the movie is past the halfway mark just sit down um, hate your time there and then enjoy yourself without enjoying yourself. I was waiting for Ashley to do it because yeah. she didn't do it because yeah. we were waiting for it well, what's she, she just fed it to her yeah, that's nothing, what she nothing, said nothing 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 oh, forget it the time halfway is in yeah. yeah when the climax of the movie happens oh when you're halfway gosh. in <laughs> And then it comes to that 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 great explosion. What? How are you doing, Mother? 
I can't. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, have question. you guys ever like been to a movie and then been like, no, this movie is so bad, I, I need to get my money back? You know, I actually, I was thinking about, I used to do this all the time when I was younger. How terrible is that? When you go with, when you're younger and you kind of go with a group of friends and if everybody's not into it, you want to get your money back because you're young and you can't really spend, I haven't done it lately though. So that says something about my maturity. I mean, I just laughed at that comment, but I guess uh, <laughs> I haven't done it in a while though. 10,000 strong and growing. Wendy Lee? Um, I should have asked my money back from Avatar The Last Airbender, but I was just so stuck in my seat because that movie just killed me. It sucked my soul. It was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> the one I did, it, the only one that I could ever remember doing it to was for Let's Be Cops. Oh. It was like 15 minutes in, I took a bite of the burger and it was filled with maggots yeah. and they were like, yeah, it was like we were so disappointed. We were like, let's get the hell out of you here. Got, you had a maggoty burger? It's yeah. a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Metaphor. I was thinking like that scene in uh, in Poltergeist. In, in Poltergeist, <laughs> in the <laughs> Lost. I tear my face off. There's yeah. a lot of maggots in horror movies in the '80s. Just so you guys know. <laughs> you ever you ever gotten your money back, Clark, successfully from a movie theater? Nope. I see. Here's the thing is that I used to work in a movie theater as well. And as Jeremy can attest to as a professional projectionist, when you work in a movie theater, it's all about the delineation of responsibility to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes up to me because I'm wearing a vest and I have some movie buttons and they ask me, hey, can I have my money? If they ask me anything, I'm like, oh, let me check with somebody else. Like you just get that look yeah. on your face like. <sighs> but you can't give that. I mean, I used register. to work in a movie theater, too. You can't you don't have that power. You have to be like, I'm going to have to speak to our manager if you want to yeah. wait over in this corner. And they usually get you free tickets or your money back. It's, if it's like the first 15 minutes, I think that's totally fair. It is. It's you bit the burger. You didn't like the burger. It was rotting or whatever. You just didn't like it. But if you if you ate the entire burger yeah, and were can't. like watching the credits, you can't get your yeah. money back. No, no, no. It's yeah. insane. It's done. You, yeah. you consumed yeah, it. Yeah, you There's finished no going it. back. Yeah. Just, be a just pay a little more attention yeah. and go to a movie you, you think you'll like better next time. All right, I, I, I can't end the show on, on Maggot Burger, so yeah. let's do one more quick Twitter question. We'll call it a day. Ew. All right, this one comes from Coffin Builder 89 who writes, would you want a very small and short Ron Perlman cameo in the new Hellboy? Um, I, I, I think I'd be fine either way. I think it'd be cool if Ron Perlman showed up for a minute. It wouldn't take me out of the movie. It'd be a nice uh, passing of the torch or fedora, as David Harbour would say, but I don't need it in there. How about you, Clark? Yeah, no, I, I actually am going to say no, I wouldn't. And the reason is, you know, just let, let Neil and, and David Harbour and, and company make their own Hellboy movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not anyone involved with the movie's fault that, that Guillermo and Ron are not on this one. So just let's keep them. Keep them separate. Schnapp, good fan service or overkill? Uh, overkill, no way. Uh, Ron Perlman is his own man, his own actor. He did Hellboy 1 and 2. He doesn't have to show up and be like, hey, here's a uh, no torch passing. Just I want to see the new Hellboy. When you're projecting the new Hellboy movie, do you want to see Ron Perlman make a cameo? Yeah, when I'm screening it at midnight, because that's what projection is due. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not counting on it. I'd like to not see it. But if it does happen, if they do it well, if it's just like a thing in passing, like a Stan Lee cameo, I, I'd, I'd find it funny. And I'd be like, oh, ha, ha, all right, that totally worked. But as I'm standing... I'd say don't do it. As he's standing or sitting, and we are going to say goodbye for today on Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank all you guys for being very participatory in the chat room today. Leave your comments on YouTube as well. Thank you to our incredible crew and our panelists up here with me. First of all, the delicious burger-fed John Schnepp. Mm, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Later tonight, I'm one of the presenters at the Stan Lee Tribute. You yeah. can go online and get to watch it online or go to movie theaters. It's playing. It's like some one night only special event type thing. We're going to get sweaty and uh, pay tribute to the man, the myth, the legend, Stan Lee. See you tonight. We have our own man and myth right next to me, Jeremy Johns. <gasps> That's the nicest thing anyone on this panel's ever said. Any panel <laughs> ever. Uh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, every, everywhere around the internet. You can find my show Awesome Tacular on Go90, where Ellis and I, we play games, we throw up pies. Schnepp and I, we do comic book shopping stuff. It's a lot of fun. You can find me not giving people their money back after they watch 100% of the movie <laughs> as a projectionist. Classy Clark Wolf. We're going to kids check you out. You can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. And if you are unable to attend the, uh, I don't know if you guys heard about this, the It Experience here in Los Angeles, the house on Neibolt Street that they built uh, for a limited time. If you can't make it, guess what? I have video that is going on the Stardust app. So you can follow me on Stardust uh, at Clark Wolf and you can actually see walking through the Niebold house. I highly recommend that follow. And Ashley Mova, where can we all find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And last but certainly not least, Wendy Lee Zaney. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel, at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. 
I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for watching today. We will be back here on Collider Video for a new episode of Collider Movie Talk. Tomorrow, this coming weekend, I'll be at the 40th anniversary of the La Jolla Comedy Store in San Diego, California. You can get tickets to my website, markellislive.com. And then I'll see you guys in Vegas, Philly, or maybe even New York City, and tomorrow. Hey guys, like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.